sentences. Uh, I can say we have some programs on articles. We use any in negative sentences. Uh, for example, we don't have any programs on conditionals so far. And we use any in questions. You ask me, do you have any programs on the present perfect tense? Well, as you understand, we use some and any when we talk about numbers or quantities. So, some means a little, a few, or a small number or amount. For example, we have some eggs. We don't know how many. Some. Any, I hope you remember that we use any in negative sentences or in questions, uh, means one, some, or all. For example, are there any X? But sometimes we don't use some, we don't use any, we don't use any articles. We use no article when we don't think about numbers at all. Okay? So here we have an example. We need X. We are talking about unlimited number. It's not important how many eggs we need. Just we need eggs. And now let's talk about some. You already know that we use some in positive sentences. So we prefer some when thinking about limited but rather indefinite numbers or quantities. We don't know, care or say exactly how much or how many. Let's look at some examples. We planted some trees in the garden. We don't know the exact number. We bought some eggs limited number, you have much paper, give me some. So limited number or amount. But there is an exception. We can sometimes use some in questions when offering or requesting something. For example, would you like some bread or could I have some water? And my friends, please keep in mind that we use some with both countable and uncountable nouns. And now I suggest watching some episodes. This one. Mm -hmm. So she's saying, maybe you would like some coffee. She is offering him a drink and she is talking about an indefinite amount of coffee. Okay? Now let's watch one more episode. Mm -hmm. She's saying, oh, do you remember, uh, he's asking, is there any tea left? And she's saying, yes, there is some in the teapot on the table. It's a positive sentence and again we are talking about some indefinite amount, some tea. Okay? And now let's talk about any. My friends, we already know that we use any in negative sentences and in questions. And just like the word some, we use any with both countable and uncountable nouns. We prefer any when thinking about limited but rather indefinite number or quantity. We don't know, care or say exactly how much or how many. Let's look at some examples. Is there any milk in the bottle? Or I don't have any money. Have you got any pictures? So limited number or amount. Okay? And now let's watch an episode. This one. He is asking her, is there any tea left? He is talking about limited amount. Is there any tea left? And now, my friends, it's time for you to practice. My friends, your task is to complete these sentences with some or any. So let's start the first sentence.
The correct sentence is He doesn't need any stamps. Sentence number two. The answer is I've bought some flowers for you. Sentence number three. And the answer is Are there any English books on the shelf? I've got more sentences. So look at this one. The correct sentence is Does he need any stamps? It's a question, so we use any. And the last sentence. And we don't have much choice. <laughs> the answer is some. Uh, I have tickets for some concerts next week. Well done. We use the word some and any when the speaker cannot specify or does not need or want to specify a number or an exact amount. For example, we've bought some eggs. I don't have any money. Sometimes before a noun we don't use anything. So, we prefer no article when thinking about unlimited numbers or quantities or have no idea of quantity. For example, I like roses. Milk has a sweet taste, there is no article before milk. Or there were trees beside the road. So no idea of number or quantity. And now let's watch an episode. This one. The speaker says, I need meat, sausages, ice cream, candy. If we look attentively at this sentence, we can see that uh, he doesn't use some, any, he doesn't use any articles at all. He says, I need meat, sausages, ice cream and candy. We have no idea how much or how many he needs. I hope this is clear because right now you are going to practice. My friends, your task is to complete each sentence with some, any or no article, okay? So, sentence number one. The correct sentence is we've bought some eggs. Sentence number two. The book says here that rice is grown in Asia. Sentence number three. The correct sentence is Have you got any pets? Very good. We prefer no article when thinking about unlimited numbers or quantities, or have no idea of the quantity. For example, I like roses. Milk has a sweet taste. And now let's watch the dialogue one more time.
Well, my friends, I hope you don't have any questions. If you have some, go to our website and watch this program one more time. So, thank you for watching Grammar Wise. Goodbye. Hi guys and girls, it's Marvin with another episode of All About, the show where we can talk about everyone and everything. Yesterday I was watching a documentary about Rupal's vultures, and these birds can fly as high as 11 kilometers. So I thought that would make a great topic for today's show. Let's talk about the champions of the animal world. You probably know that cheetahs are the fastest animals on Earth. These cats can get their speed up to 120 kilometers per hour. But cheetahs can only do it for a few hundred meters, and then they're done. So they could never catch one of these guys. Proghorns are twice as slow as cheetahs, about 65 kilometers per hour but they can keep that speed up to five kilometers. Another fast and durable animal is an ostrich. As you know, ostriches are too heavy to fly, but they can easily run as fast as 50 kilometers per hour for 30 minutes. That's basically how I drive to work every day. Guys, I have a question. Who do you think is the strongest animal on the planet? The elephant? The rhino? Nope. Actually, it's the Taurus scarab. This little fellow can pull things that are 1,140 times its own weight. That's like me trying to lift 82 tons. What about jumping? Maybe it's a puma who can clear a five meter obstacle or a dolphin who can jump seven meters above water. Wrong again. Here's a hint. It's another insect. Insects are small animals that usually have six legs and wings. It's the largest group of animals on Earth. So who's the jumping champion? It's the frog hopper which can launch itself 70 centimeters in the air. Doesn't sound impressive, you'd say. Well, if you convert 70 centimeters into human size, that's like jumping over a 200 meter skyscraper. I saved the best for last. This is a tardigrade, also known as a water bear. Looks kind of funny, don't you think? In reality, tardigrades are the toughest animals in the world. They can survive extreme cold and heat, high and low pressure, radiation, 
and complete lack of food. One more amazing fact is tardigrades are the only animals that can survive in outer space. Unbelievable. It's time to test your knowledge. Here's a little trivia about today's episode. How fast can prog horns run? 50 kilometers per hour, 65 kilometers per hour, 82 kilometers per hour, 120 kilometers per hour. Prog horns can reach and maintain speeds of up to 65 kilometers per hour. How many legs do insects have? Two, four, Six, eight. Insects have six legs. It's time for me to go. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of All About. It's been Marvin, and I'll see you next time. Ciao, cacao. Charles Schwab, American Steel Magnet. A man can succeed at almost anything for which he has unlimited enthusiasm. Нет ничего невозможного для энтузиаста своего дела. Walter Chrysler, American Industrialist. The real secret of success is enthusiasm. Истинный секрет успеха заключается в энтузиазме. Leo Szilard, Hungarian physicist. If you want to succeed in the world, you don't have to be much cleverer than other people. You just have to be one day earlier. Чтобы преуспеть в жизни, не надо быть намного умнее других. Надо просто опередить других на один день. Job seeking, job application, job application, a formal request to be considered for a job. We are considering your application for the job of marketing manager. Candidate, candidate, someone that a company is considering for a job. We are interviewing the candidates on Friday. Curriculum Vitae. Curriculum Vitae, abbreviation CV, a document that gives details of a person's experience and qualifications. Synonym, resume, American English. It is important to prepare your CV in the right way. Choose the correct word or phrase to fill in the gap. Curriculum Vitae, CV, candidate, Job application provides an overview of a person's experience and other qualifications. In some countries, a uh, is typically the first item that a potential employer encounters regarding the job seeker and is typically used to screen applicants, often followed by an interview when seeking employment. Curriculum Vitae, or CV, provides an overview of a person's experience and other qualifications. 
In some countries, a CV is typically the first item the potential employer encounters regarding the job seeker and is typically used to screen applicants, often followed by an interview when seeking employment. Job seeking. Headhunting. Headhunting. Finding a manager with the right skills and experience to do a particular job, often by persuading a suitable person to leave their present job. We could ask a headhunting firm to find a new production director. Human resources. Human resources. A department in a company that deals with recruitment, training, and helping employees. He works in human resources. Interview. Interview. A formal meeting where someone is asked questions to find out if they are suitable for a job. I have an interview for a job at Microsoft next week. Fill in the gap with an appropriate word. When you persuade someone to leave their job and go to work for another company in a similar position, it's called... When you persuade someone to leave their job and go to work for another company in a similar position, it's called headhunting. It's me, Joe. You're watching English Up. Now, I've just come from the gym, so now I want to make myself a healthy meal. I have some healthy stuff here, but in London, people often work 24-7 and forget to have any physical exercise or a proper meal. However, having a healthy life is actually pretty easy, and that's the topic of today's episode. So let's talk about having a healthy lifestyle. Today in English Up, tips for having good health and finding good food in London. So, you've decided to become healthy. Many people think that they should eat less fat or not eat at all. Other people think that if they go to the gym, they will immediately feel better. Well, that's not how you do it. So let's watch a video with some good tips on healthy lifestyle. Try to remember them. Healthy lifestyle starts with two simple components, correct food and physical activities. First, you should plan your nutrition. You need to keep a good balance of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Meat and fish have a lot of protein and good fats. Herbs and vegetables provide our body with carbohydrates. Don't forget about fruits because they are full of vitamins. You should be very careful about convenience food and fast food. Such food is badly balanced and can have a bad impact on your digestion. It's better to spend some time on a homemade healthy meal. Physical activities is another important element of healthy lifestyle. Sports help reduce stress and keep your body in shape. The combination of physical exercise and healthy nutrition is an easy way to longevity. Very useful video, wasn't it? Let's see what you can remember from it and we'll take this small test. Match the words with the categories, fats, proteins, carbohydrates. Meat, fish, vegetables, herbs. Great job. Why not do another quick test? I'm sure you won't have any problems with this either. 
Answer the questions. Is homemade food better than convenience food? Yes, homemade food is much better than convenience food. Why are fruits useful? Because they have a lot of vitamins. How do physical activities help us? They reduce stress and keep our bodies in shape. Well done. Sports and good nutrition are the best things when it comes to health. Speaking of nutrition, in the video we heard such words as fast food, convenience food and homemade food. London has lots of places where you can get all of these, so why not ask Londoners what they like to eat and why? Don't miss the next part of our show. Coming up next, healthy eating in London. We're back on English Up, and today we're talking about healthy lifestyle. All people have different tastes and eating schedules. If you pay attention, you can see a lot of Londoners drinking their coffee on the streets in the morning or enjoying their lunch in the park in the afternoon. But is their food healthy enough? Let's hit the streets and ask some Londoners about their food preferences. Surrounded by fast food and convenience foods. In London, stay away from uh, the fast food that is everywhere. I think it's very important um, if you want to live long and happy. <laughs> in terms of eating, a lot of people will eat, or busy people will eat something in the morning, and then they'll go four, five, six hours without eating anything again, sit down at their desk and eat wait till they get home in the evening, which could be another six or seven hours. But the best thing to do is to eat small meals regularly, to eat something in the morning, a couple of hours after that, have something small, a small snack, like some nuts or some fruit or some yoghurt. At lunchtime, have another small snack. Um, so it's about five or six small meals a day, as opposed to two or three large meals a day. That helps metabolism, which burns fat, um, and it keeps your energy levels higher as well. It's good to eat healthily but you only live once, so have a pizza when you can. I do try and eat healthily. I don't try and eat too unhealthily. If you eat, if you eat away, takeaways and everything, it actually becomes much more expensive than buying a salad, buying a bag of salad or something to put with your own cheese and some ham on the side. Did you catch the word meal? Meal is food that you eat in one sitting. For example, breakfast or lunch. There are some more good words that describe types of food. Let's watch the video again and try to find them. No, no. It's surrounded by fast food and convenience foods. In London, stay away from uh, the fast food that is everywhere. I think it's very important um, if you want to live long and happy. <laughs> in terms of eating, a lot of people will eat, or busy people will eat something in the morning, and then they'll go four, five, six hours without eating anything again, sit down at their desk and eat, wait till they get home in the evening, which could be another six or seven hours. But the best thing to do is to eat small meals regularly, to eat something in the morning, a couple of hours after that, have something small, a small snack, like some nuts or some fruit or some yogurt. At lunchtime, have another small snack. Um, so it's about five or six small meals a day as opposed to two or three large meals a day. That helps metabolism, which burns fat, um, and it keeps your energy levels higher as well. It's good to eat healthily, but you only live once, so have a pizza when you can. I do try and eat healthily. I don't try and eat too unhealthily. If you eat, if you eat away, takeaways and everything, it actually becomes much more expensive than buying a salad, buying a bag of salad or something to put with your own cheese and some ham on the side. Excellent. So snack is any small food, for example, an apple or a bar of chocolate. Convenience food 
is food that can be prepared very easily or is food that's ready to eat. So a bar of chocolate is not only a snack, but is also a convenience food. And finally, takeaway is food that you order in a cafe or a restaurant and take with you to eat later. Let's take a small test to see if you can match these types of food with the pictures. Match the words with the pictures. Convenience food. Takeaway. Snack. Well done. Now, let's try something more difficult, so be attentive. Choose the correct answer. If you want to live long and happy, stay away from fast food. It's best to eat small meals regularly. Eating small meals help your body keep a high level of energy. All right, I hope it's been a very useful episode of English Up. Health is the most important thing that we have, so try not to lose it by forgetting about sports and other physical activities. My name's Joe. See you guys later. Every profession in the world is important and useful, especially the job you do or the one you have to deal with. But sometimes it's difficult to find the right words to use in English. I'm Casey, here with Jack of All Trades, and we are going to help you out. So, what profession are We going to discuss today. Let me give you a hint. This person can take you to different places. No, it's not a driver. Today we'll be talking about
journey describes a longer travel over land. And voyage means a long travel, usually at sea. Hello, I want to plan a trip for my vacation. And what is vacation, you might be thinking? And you can go on a trip. Vacation. Time off from work. What kind of trip do you want? Active, sightseeing, or just relaxing? I would love to go sightseeing. All right. Charles wants a sightseeing tour. Hmm. What is that? Well... That's a tour where you visit different famous or interesting and historical places. Sightseeing. Visiting different famous or interesting places. I can recommend you either something exotic, like Bangkok, or a tour to Barcelona. What would you like to book? So, Charles needs to book a tour. When you book something, it means that you reserve a room in a hotel, a seat on a plane, or in our case, a tour. To book. To reserve a room in a hotel, a seat on a plane, or a tour. All right, we are back with Charles and Veronica, the travel agent. We already know that Charles wants to go on vacation and he wants a sightseeing tour. Let's see where he will go. Well, I would like a one week trip to Bangkok in a month. Good choice, as it's a low season there next month. There's a flight on the 15th of June, and you'll arrive in Bangkok at 1 p.m. How much does it cost? There is a good price of 440 pounds for the round-trip tickets. Okay. So, Charles wants to go to Bangkok in a month, and it's low season there. Low season means the prices are lower and there won't be that many people on vacation. And not many people on the beach. Low season. The time of year when there won't be many people on holiday and the prices are lower. There's a flight on the 15th of June, and you'll arrive in Bangkok at 1 p.m. So, Charles will arrive in Bangkok at 1 p.m. This means he will get there by that time. To arrive. To get to the place where you are going. There's a flight on the 15th of June, and you'll arrive in Bangkok at 1 p.m. How much does it cost? There is a good price of 440 pounds for the round-trip tickets. Well, round-trip tickets means you have a ticket to get to your destination and to come back home. Round-trip ticket. A ticket to the destination point and back. Charles and Veronica, the travel agent, are arranging a holiday for Charles in Bangkok. Now, they've already discussed the flight details and it's time to talk about where he will stay. We can arrange a transfer from the airport to your hotel. That would be great. And what hotel can you recommend? What preferences do you have? 
B&B, and a double bed. I can recommend you a nice four-star hotel. How much is it per night? 100 pounds a night. Okay, that will do. A transfer from the airport to the hotel. What's that? Well, a transfer is the process of moving from one place to another. In our case, from the airport to the hotel. Transfer. The process of moving from one place to another. What preferences do you have? B&B and a double bed. B&B, what's that? Well, B&B stands for bed and breakfast, meaning you get a place to sleep and breakfast in the morning. B&B, bed and breakfast. And double bed simply means the bed is big enough for two people. And this is important if you are not traveling alone, but with that special someone. Double bed, the bed for two people. Today, we talked about travel agents and how to communicate with them. And now you know what to say when you are at the travel agency. This is Veronica. She is a travel agent. And this is her client, Charles. Hello. I want to plan a trip for my vacation. Where would you like to go? I haven't decided yet. What kind of trip do you want? Active? Sightseeing or just relaxing? I would love to go sightseeing. When are you planning your vacation? In a month. I see. I can recommend you either something exotic, like Bangkok, or a tour to Barcelona. What would you like to book? Well, I would like a one-week trip to Bangkok in a month. Good choice, as it's a low season there next month. There's a flight on the 15th of June, and you'll arrive in Bangkok at 1 p.m. How much does it cost? There is a good price of 440 pounds for the round-trip tickets. Okay. We can arrange a transfer from the airport to your hotel. That would be great. And what hotel can you recommend? What preferences do you have? B&B &B and a double bed. I can recommend you a nice four-star hotel. How much is it per night? 100 pounds a night. Okay, that will do. Well, there are still so many great professions out there. Anyway... I've been Casey with Jack of All Trades, and I will see you soon. Trip. Vacation. Sightseeing. To book. Low season. To arrive. Round trip ticket. Transfer. BNB. &B. Double bed.
tall or short, slender or curvy? Does anyone know what real beauty is? Some say that the perfect measurements are 36, 28, 36. But can beauty really be measured with a tape? Her bust is 44 inches. Her waist, 35 inches. Her hips, 46 inches. Our guest today proves that beauty is found in the eye of the beholder, not in the numbers. Meet Jade Mary Elliott, a plus-size model from the UK. Hi, my name's Jade Mary Elliott. I'm a plus-size model. I am based in London and I'm 23. Jade Mary Elliott has been modelling plus-size clothes since she was 14 years old. She started as a photo model and then began doing catwalk shows. Now she's one of the most in-demand plus-size models in London. Style shouldn't have a size. Jade Mary Elliott. Today we're at the workshop of Island Blue, a London-based plus-size brand. Here, designers busily create clothes for full-figured women. As one of London's most sought-after plus-size models, Jade Mary Elliott is currently the face of this fledgling company. But how did her brilliant career in the modelling business begin? Um, well, when I was about 13, I did a fashion course at school, an extracurricular course. At the end, we had a photo shoot. Um, and then at that point, I decided, oh, I actually really like this. Um, I signed with an agency up north where I lived. So I did work with them from the age of about 14. Um, a lot of commercial stuff. Um, and then I had a break while I got my degree in performing arts and started again um, this year with, um, you know, plus size modeling more, um, less commercial, more high-end fashion, beauty, and a lot of bridal as well. But what does being a plus size model mean to Jade Mary Elliott? Well, for me, it's a model who um, is, has more curves, is slightly bigger, um, you know, someone that can set a good example for people of all different shapes and sizes, you know, some people are naturally built to be a size 6, a size 8, and that's fine. Um, but then, you know, someone who is um, looking at the media from a perspective of someone who is maybe a size 16, um, they have no one to relate to. So a plus size model, someone that, you know, curvy women can relate to. Today, plus size modelling is getting more and more popular. The old stereotypes of super skinny models are being replaced by full-figured women. Models like Queen Latifah, Tara Lynn and Robin Lawley found international fame and glory in this business. People are always thinking, saying to me, oh wow, you look amazing on the catwalk. Um, I just hope that, you know, when I'm walking and I walk with confidence that it's inspiring, you know, women and young girls that are sitting there thinking, oh, if she can do that, then I can, you know, if she's beautiful and she believes she's beautiful, then, you know, I must be beautiful as well. It's, you know, and hopefully trying to inspire other people. Jade Mary Elliott proves that success in the fashion industry does not require being extremely skinny. But has she ever dreamed about losing weight? Um, no. Um, I've tried that, um, you know, as I was growing up, um, I was always quite curvy. Um, I've never been a stick. Um, and I'm not made to be one, I think. Um, even if I tried to lose as much weight as I could, I hit the gym hard every day, didn't eat, I would still be curvy. I'm not made to be small. Um, and I think I don't need to lose weight to feel good about myself. I'm fine the way I am. So does Jade Mary Elliott always accept herself as beautiful? Uh, not always, not when I wake up in the mornings. Um, but I think, um, especially growing up, I had a hard time accepting myself, which a lot of young girls do. But I think I reached my 20s and thought, you know, you know, why, why can't I be beautiful? Um, why can't I be glamorous? Uh, you know, um, 
style shouldn't have a size and I think everyone should just accept themselves as beautiful and the world would be a nicer place. <laughs>
In addition to plus-size modeling, Jade has a wide variety of other interests. She's a professional actress and a classical singer with a BA in performing arts. That I got my degree in performing arts last year, so I graduated with that. Um, I've just um, recently completed a TEFL course, so teaching English as a foreign language as well. <clears throat> um, I've done a lot of work as a drama teacher. I like to do yoga. Um, I have a dog, so I spend a lot of time walking my very naughty chocolate Labrador. Um, I like going out with friends, um, socialising. I like, I'm a people person, so going out and doing fun things, exploring, travelling. Her life is full of interesting people and experiences. But why does she choose modelling over all of the other alternatives? Um, well, my favourite thing to do is bridal. So um, there's been a lot of amazing wedding dresses, um, big kind of meringue things, you know, lots of sparkles. You know, that's my ideal. If I could wear a wedding dress every day, I would. I think the first time I did catwalk, um, I was maybe 15 or 16, and it was bridal catwalk. So, you know, as a, teen, a young teenager in a bridal dress, um, being able to walk in, you know, in this beautiful place where I was, um, that was, for me, an amazing moment, you know, the first um, catwalk ever. Like, wow, I'm in this bridal dress in front of loads of people, it's amazing. So, yeah, that's probably the best, the best moment, yeah. Yeah, you don't need to get married if you do bridal modelling because you get to wear the dresses. So, <laughs> I really enjoy modelling. Um, it can be intense and very hectic, schedule's very hectic, um, not a lot of free time, but I think um, to be doing a job every day that you enjoy is, that's living your life when you go into work and not enjoying it, that's, that's not living to me. So yeah, it's, it's living. This has been Jade Mary Elliott, a plus size model from London. She's changing the way designers view their profession and the way people view themselves. Her beauty is in the way she models her life. And when the lights go down after the photo shoot, our eyes will continue to follow Jade Mary as she models her labor of love. <laughs> Forgot what you said, though. <laughs>What is business? Is it making money or helping people? Who are businessmen? Are they CEOs or small business owners? No matter how big or small a business is, it speaks the same language. The language of business. Hello, my name is Jason Palmer and welcome to the language of business. Before we plunge into the world of entrepreneurship, here's a question for you. How many people work in the publishing industry in the UK? Is it 140,000, 230,000, or 310,000? And the answer is, publishing is estimated to have accounted for over 230,000 jobs in the UK creative economy. In simple words, publishing is making information available for public view. Traditionally, this term refers to printed works, such as books, newspapers, and magazines. More recent types of publishing include electronic resources like websites, blogs, and ebooks. However, to this day, physical books still remain popular and relevant. Since the invention of writing, books have been an integral part of our life. Over the course of centuries, the process of book publishing has changed significantly and includes many stages, from rights negotiations and editing, to printing and distribution. And today, we're going to meet Rose Green, a publishing assistant for the London-based publisher and bookseller Persephone Books. Okay, so my name is Rose Green and I work for Persephone Books and I'm a publishing assistant. Persephone Books was founded in 1998 by Nicola Buman. 
The shop specializes in publishing lost and out of print books by women writers of the 20th century. The name Persephone was chosen as a symbol of female creativity, as well as of new beginnings. Customers can make their orders at persephonebooks.co.uk, as well as in the official bookshop at 59 Lambs Conduit Street, London. What does the process of book publishing look like? What are the stages from actually writing a book to having its physical copy made? Let's ask Rose. What is the first stage of book publishing? Is it typesetting? Maybe the design? Or is it obtaining the copyright? What do you think? Yeah, most of our books are still in copyright. Um, so we'll either contact the family of the original author who will hold the copyright or often an agent. Um, occasionally, if the author's still alive, it'll be through a literary agent. Rose says that most of the books they publish are still in copyright. Copyright is the exclusive legal right to produce copies and to distribute a literary, musical, or artistic work. So Rose means they need to get permission to publish a book. To do this, Persephone Books contacts the family of the author or sometimes their literary agent. It's a person who represents an author and manages his or her business affairs. Yeah, most of our books are still in copyright. Um, so we'll either contact the family of the original author who will hold the copyright or often an agent. Um, occasionally, if the author's still alive, it'll be through a literary agent. Good. Now let's find out what happens when publishing rights are finally obtained. And then we work out the rights. Um, and either we typeset the books ourselves, or if the original um, publication of the book had a really nice, um, sort of looked really nice, a nice type typeface and uh, nice illustrations, then we'll do a facsimile version and it'll come out looking the way that it did when it was originally published. Rose says that they usually typeset the books themselves. To typeset means to compose the book and prepare it for being typed. It includes creating a font, making the design, etc. But if the original book was composed nicely, the company would publish a facsimile version of it. Facsimile is an exact copy or reproduction. It's also a synonym of replica. So, what comes first in the publishing process? Right! First you have to obtain the copyright. So we'll either contact the family of the original author who will hold the copyright, or often an agent. Um, occasionally, if the author's still alive, it'll be through a literary agent. Let's check what you've learned so far. Try to match the words to their meanings. Match the words to their meanings. Let's check. Copyright is the legal right to reproduce something. Literary agent is a person who manages business issues for writers. And facsimile is an exact copy. Persephone Books was initially run from a basement office in Clerkenwell, and the first book published was William, an Englishman, by Cicely Hamilton. After three years in the basement, Persephone Book number 21, Miss Pettigrew Lives for a Day, by Winifred Watson, became a word-of-mouth bestseller and even received Hollywood treatment. Following its success, Persephone moved its office to Bloomsbury, also opening its first shop on the same premises. How often do people buy books? Are there any high seasons for book publishers? A high season is the time of year when there is the biggest demand for a product. It's also the same as peak season. How big is Christmas demand 
for Persephone Books. 50 books, 100 books, a few hundred books. What will be your guess? Let's check your intuition. Definitely Christmas is a big one. Um, we publish our new books twice a year. So for us, we have um, sort of peak seasons in April and October when we publish our new books. So it's suddenly very busy around then. But Christmas is a, is a huge time where we are sending out kind of hundreds and hundreds of books. It's, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> so... How many books are sold during Christmas? Correct. Persephone Books sell several hundred copies every Christmas. A good book is one of the best presents you can give to your friends and family. So, if you ever need one, Persephone Books has got you covered. Persephone publishes novels, short stories, diaries, memoirs, and cookery books. Each book has a trademark grey cover, a fabric end paper with matching bookmark, and a preface by writers such as Jilly Cooper, David Kinston, and Elaine Showalter. It's these small details which make Persephone books truly special and loved by their readers. Now, let's move on to the next part of our program and find out what Rose's responsibilities are in the shop. What does Rose do for Persephone Books? Dealing with subscriptions and social media, organizing the computer files and supplying the shop, or all of the above? Because we're such a small company, I kind of do whatever needs doing. Um, so I'll serve in the shop when we have customers. I also am in charge of sending out the book subscription books. So each week I have to go through and figure out who needs what. Rose says that one of her responsibilities is serving in the shop. To serve means talking to customers and helping them to choose and buy a product. So I'll serve in the shop when we have customers. I also am in charge of sending out the book subscription books. So each week I have to go through and figure out who needs what. Also, Rose sends out the subscription books. Subscription is a payment for consecutive issues of a newspaper or a book. Send out means to send copies of the same document to a large number of people. In our case, subscribers. Okay, what else does Rose do? Let's watch. And also uh, databasing and sending out the orders that we get each day. Um, I also do things for social media, so like taking photos of Instagram and stuff. Um, what else? <laughs> Restocking the shop, uh, the occasional bit of proofreading or, um, you know, writing something up, you know, checking that things are looking okay on the website. So... Uh, all sorts, sending things out to bookshops. Another one of Rose's responsibilities is dealing with the database. Database is a large amount of organized information stored in a computer. Obviously, Persephone has a lot of 